Someone wants to speak to you. Zoe! Zoe, are you there? It's you! I don't believe it. You actually made it. We both did. You didn't forget about me. I told you I'd send help. And I always keep my promises. Thank you, Ethan. It was July 2017, and Ethan Winters was a hero. Evie was destroyed because of his actions, and the threat of the mold was gone from Dolphy, Louisiana. Chris Redfield and the BSAA were able to locate Zoe Baker and get her the help she needed, alongside her uncle Joe Baker. Joe Baker was deemed free from any mold infection and was allowed to return home to the solitary lifestyle he desired. Zoe was taken into BSAA custody while the mold infection cleared from her body, and the entire area around the Baker property was sealed off by the National Guard until an investigation of the entire region was complete. Immediately, rumors began spreading about the commotion in Dulvey. Rumors that Jack Baker had murdered his family, then killed himself. Some claimed to have seen a giant black monster rising from the swamps. It was clear that the entire incident couldn't be kept secret for long, and the BSA began its damage control. The difficult truth was that Evie only arrived in Louisiana due to the BSAA's own failure capturing her three years before, a mistake that cost the Bakers and countless others their lives. The organization couldn't afford to have his image tarnished and worked with the local police department to implement a cover story. Later in July, the Dulvey County Sheriff's Office reported that the remains of the Baker family and the sewer gator crew were found on the Baker property. The reason they died? An underground natural gas leak made of hydrogen sulfide a natural gas that was extremely unlikely to even appear in Dulvey. But that was the official story, and the public was full of its own suspicions. The BSA created a narrative that would keep the public away from the truth. Chris Redfield was disgusted at the BSA's refusal to accept accountability, and the seeds of distrust began forming between Chris and the organization he had spent years fighting with against the threat of bioterror. They were more concerned about maintaining a positive public image than finding and destroying bioweapons. Zoe Baker remained in custody for a time and was eventually exposed to the public news. She was shocked that her name was among the dead identified in the Baker incident. Unknown to her, the BSA prepared a new identity for her and let her go, as long as she didn't go public with the information she knew. For Zoe, it was a second chance at life. She embraced her new identity, moved to New Orleans, and became an investigative reporter. After the Baker incident, the BSAA also quarantined Ethan and Mia for a time. It was obvious that Ethan was originally an innocent bystander that became involved in the situation, but Mia's direct affiliation with the connections made her a criminal in the eyes of the BSAA. Mia spent three years of her life living under the horror of one of their bioweapons. She simply wanted to leave everything behind and start a life over again with Ethan. Even after years of investigation, the BSAA had no real understanding of the connection, structure, or leadership. In exchange for all the information she had, the BSAA agreed not to prosecute her and relocated Ethan and Mia to a safer location. Mia was also promised that Ethan would never find out the details of her previous employment. The couple was moved out of the States to Eastern Europe, given a new home, a new life. Back in New Orleans, Zoe began searching for the Winters. Publicly, they had vanished, and the BSA files on them were classified for their own protection. Zoe wanted to reach out to stay in touch and thank them for saving her life. With her resources as an investigative reporter, Zoe began taking a deeper look into the BSAA to get clues of the Winters' whereabouts, and she discovered a rotten and ruined organization. The BSAA had plenty of secrets many of its high-ranking members weren't aware of, and it was an organization suffering from regular leaks and moles infiltrating it from within. She also learned more about the mold that had infected her, a parasitic organism the BSAA referred to as Mutamycete capable of infecting human cells, rewriting their DNA, and capable of creating its own muscle tissue and brain and nervous system when combined with other bacteria. The horrors she had seen in the Baker home were making much more sense. One day a letter arrived at Zoe's apartment. Finally, communication from Mia. They had been searching for each other since the Baker incident, and the BSAA wasn't allowing them to communicate with anybody from their previous life. Mia was able to get the letter sent via a mutual connection, and it let Zoe know that they were okay. 
living happily together in Eastern Europe. Mia's biggest reveal was a photo she sent celebrating six months with their daughter. Mia and Ethan had a baby girl named Rosemary Winters. Satisfied to know the Winters were okay, Zoe continued investigating the BSAA and uncovered details hinting that internal strife was causing strong friction between Chris Redfield and the organization. Chris knew that Mia and Ethan would have targets on their back now from interfering with the Connection's bioweapon experiments. Over the years, he kept an eye on them and became close to the couple, even going as far as teaching Ethan military tactics and weapon handling to protect himself and his family. Ethan even spent some time self-learning by reading a book called Gun Survivalist, a heavy firearms manual for field combat situations. The book was written by Joseph Kendo, brother of Robert Kendo, the Raccoon City gun shop owner that perished with the city. Robert and Joseph both supported Stars with Weapon Designs, and Joseph served as their weapons instructor. He also finalized the design of the Samurai Edge Beretta, and even customized Leon S. Kennedy's handgun before the Ganado incident, designed from his shop in San Francisco. The book he wrote was a vastly important resource for Ethan's weapon knowledge. But Chris Redfield knew there was more to the mold in Dulvey, Louisiana, than just Evie. The threat of the Mutamycet ran deeper, but the BSA's incompetence and constant red tape kept him from investigating the situation properly. Something was going on within the BSAA. Cover-ups preventing him from doing his job, they were behaving like the original Umbrella Corporation. After years of fighting bioweapons as a BSA soldier, one of their original founding members, Chris Redfield, decided to leave it behind and set out on his own to find answers. BSA was outraged that the legendary Chris Redfield went rogue. Chris, without authorization, also took command of an elite BSA Special Forces unit known as the Hound Wolf Squad. Comprised of other soldiers losing trust in the BSAA, now loyal to Chris Redfield. He became team leader, referred to as Alpha. A portion of his unit was comprised of a veteran sniper called Rolando Elba, codenamed Umber Eyes, Dion Wilson, a former dog handler codenamed K9, Charlie Graham, the team's communication expert codenamed Night Howl, John Perlman, the team's expert machine gunner codenamed Lobo, and Emily Burkhoff, codenamed Tundra, a former undercover DEA agent. Her undercover skills were exceptionally valuable during a mission investigating the connections where she came across information revealing Mother Miranda's identity and plan to resurrect her daughter. Tundra informed Chris and the rest of the squad and they immediately began planning to take out Mother Miranda. She was responsible for the connections getting access to the mold and now the Winters family was in danger. The Connections had a mole within the BSAA that provided them the location of Mia, Ethan, and their daughter Rose. The best revenge against them was to give Miranda exactly what she wanted from the beginning, her daughter. The Winters had no idea how special Rose was. She was the perfect evolution of the EV experiment, exactly what the Connections were attempting to create in a lab. Rose was the perfect vessel for Ava's resurrection. Mia had no mutamycet infection, but since Ethan's body was comprised of the mold replicating human DNA, Rose was a mutated combination of both. A young baby in appearance and unknown to her own parents, completely made of the same mold her father was. But without any of the gene editing, the connections did to program a rapidly age Evie. The connections passed the information to Mother Miranda, and she determined that Rose was a pure, perfect vessel for her daughter Ava to inhabit. She needed Rose, and learned everything she could about Mia. When Miranda was ready to abduct Rose, she tracked down the Winters family and captured Mia while Ethan was away. She locked her away in her village and returned to Ethan in the form of his wife, copying her exact image and mannerisms, leading to the events of Resident Evil Village. Miranda infiltrated Ethan's life, posing as Mia, and spent time with Rose until she was ready to abduct her. Chris and the Hound Wolf Squad were aware of her plan and monitored the Winters home. They had no idea where Mia was, but they knew that Miranda was imitating her. The situation led to some debate within the team whether to let Ethan know the truth or not. Chris made the decision to keep Ethan in the dark. If he knew Mia was taken and Rose was in danger, he would surely try getting involved and it would complicate the mission. On one quiet evening at home, Miranda read Rose a storybook telling a spooky fairy tale to put her to sleep and Ethan laid his daughter down in the safety of her crib. There you go, sweetheart. Don't you worry. I'll be right downstairs. Daddy won't let those weird fairy tale monsters get you. 
Unknown to Ethan, Chris and the Hound Wolf Squad were just outside, waiting for the moment to strike. Once Rose was safely upstairs and out of the way, they decided to act. Everything's gonna Seriously, be- Seriously? Think we can just forget about what happened in Louisiana? It happened so long ago. I just- I don't understand why you are so- <sighs> Mia! Get down! Mia! Oh, God! Chris? What the hell? Sorry, Ethan. No! What? Why? All clear. Rose? What the hell are you doing with my daughter? Package secure, sir. Take him away. I said get your hands off her! Ethan, no. Rose. Get him out. Where's Chris Redfield? And Rose? Who is this? This is a secure channel. You and Bob Walker are the one. Fuck. What the hell happened here? When Ethan awoke, he found his vehicle escort overturned, and his captors dead. He was alone in unfamiliar territory somewhere out in the woods of Eastern Europe. He believed that Mia was dead, and his daughter was missing. In reality, Mother Miranda survived the attack and pretended to be Mia's dead body, then attacked it and escaped with Baby Rose. Once she took Rose to the village, everything changed for its residents. Mother Miranda prepared a ritual to replace Rose's consciousness with Ava's, but the mold needed to be stronger to perform such a miracle. It had to feed. The safety of the villagers was no longer her concern. Since she discovered Ava's perfect vessel, she no longer needed test subjects. The bodies of the villagers instead would become a food source for the mold, and Miranda unleashed the lichens from their stronghold and gave them freedom to feed as they please. The safety that Miranda usually provided had come to an end, and the village fell into chaos. As villagers hid desperately from the lichen threat, confused as to why Mother Miranda had forsaken them. Once Ethan crossed through the woods, he set his eyes on the immense mountain range and devastated village down below. Where the hell am I? Ethan made his way down. Perhaps there would be some assistance below, some way to call for help, or some way to get home. When he arrived, the silence was immediately noticeable. Houses were either abandoned or incredibly damaged. Instead of finding help, Ethan encountered a village in the grip of terror. A new nightmare. No, no! Friendly! Friendly! Who are you? Who sent you? Nobody. There was an accident down on the road and... What's going on? I... Oh no! They're coming. Who is? What the hell was that? Do you have a gun? What? Please tell me you have a gun. No, why would I? Take it! Take it! Hey, are you 
you listening? Hey! What the... Hey, can you hear me? Uh, it's you. The child's father. Child? Hey, wait. Do you mean Rose? Is she here? <laughs> Rose! Rose! Yes. She is in great danger. Since Mother Miranda brought her to the village, we have fallen into darkness. What are you talking about? The monsters? Ethan discovered what were once villagers, now monsters created with Mother Miranda's gift that ravaged the village and its people. Once Miranda realized Ethan was there, she decided to call the Lycans off and keep him alive, changing her appearance into that of an old hag to keep her true identity secret. With his resilient, mold-created body, he could play one of the most important parts of her plan. For now, he would be tested. Ethan believed his daughter had to be somewhere in that village. He only desired to find her and leave. While exploring, he found other survivors, a young woman called Elena and her father. He was heavily bleeding, wounded from a lichen attack, and Elena revealed that a group of survivors were hiding in a nearby house. Louisa! Open up! It's me, Elena! Stop shouting. You'll draw the monsters! Alien, calm down. Who's this? A friend! Stay back. <laughs> father! For God's sake, Julian, let us in! Uh. No, they'll smell the blood. You'll endanger us all. My father will die out here. That's not my problem. What's going on? These people want to let a dying man into our home. Come now. These people are our friends. Go on. Go inside. Come now. This way. You're not from this village. Uh, no. I'm Ethan. Yulian, go make yourself useful and check the grounds. I said go! Elena trusts you? Then so do I. Come inside, Ethan. What the fuck is this? Outsiders, you're gonna get us all killed! Quiet! Anton! He helped Leonardo and Elena. We were doing fine by ourselves. Please, Ethan, take a seat. Is this all that's left? From your entire village? All that's left? All that's left? There is no one left! <laughs> what are you doing? Leonardo, what's wrong? Are you okay? <laughs> Oh, no! Ah! 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 
my father. Hey, hey, that wasn't your father anymore. You did the right thing. <laughs> Elena, Elena, no. There's nothing you can do. Papa! This entire place yeah. is collapsing. Yeah. Yeah. You couldn't save him. <clears throat> What are you thinking? Step back. We can bust out with this. Try not to breathe in the smoke. There. That's our way out. Thank God. But what then? The village is still full of monsters. We can't fight them. There's too many. Hey. Hey, don't talk like that. We'll find a safe house to put you in until I can find my daughter. My hunch is she's in that old castle. No. That place is full of nothing but blood and death. And I don't want to be alone while you're... Father? Elena, no! That's not him! Not anymore! Elena! He said my name! Father! Wait, it's not safe! Uh. Yeah. Uh. Yeah. Uh. Stay there! Uh. Uh. Come on! Give me your hand! Ethan, go! Save your daughter! Elena, uh. don't give up! Reach for me! God damn it! Why is everyone dying on me? Elena was dead. Someone else that Ethan had failed to save. And her father showed that a serious wound from a lichen could result in infection. Ethan bringing them to the rest of the survivors was their death sentence. Now only Ethan remained. If Rose was in fact being held in the village, she would likely be inside the enormous castle overseeing it. He entered the gate leading to the castle that led to an underground passageway where he met a stranger, one of the four lords Mother Miranda placed in charge of the village. Well, well. Didn't think anyone was left. You must be pretty tough. Huh. Who the fuck are you? Oh. You're not local. Even better. Mother Miranda's gonna love you. <laughs> the man is of no real use to anyone else. And my daughters do so love entertaining foreigners. Uh. Furthermore, I can show them that you entrust the mortal to house the task. My daughters and I will deliver to you. Out of this way, ugly! I wanna see! <laughs> He's awake! Brother, shut the fuck up! What? Where? You mean you'll screw around with him in private? Where's the fun in that? Give him to me, and I'll put on a show that everybody can enjoy. Oh, so gauche. What do we care for bread and circuses? The man thing's suffering is assured. Yak, yak, if the man's dick is cut off in the castle, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> I've heard all your arguments. Some of you were less persuasive than others, but I've made my decision. Heisenberg, the man's fate is in your hands. Mother Miranda, I must protest. Heisenberg is but a child, and his devotion to you is questionable. Give the mortal to me, and I will ensure he is ready. Shut your damn phone! And don't be a sore loser! You'll find your food somewhere else. Quiet now, child. Adults are talking. I'm the child. You're the one who's arguing with Miranda's decision! You wouldn't know responsibility if it was well- Oh, keep growing! One day your head might actually fit your ego! Fight! Fight! 
Don't I don't get a say in this. Silence! My decision is final. There will be no argument. Remember from whence you came. Thank you. Huh. Lycans and gentlemen, we thank you for waiting. And now let the games begin. Let's see what you have there, Ethan Winters. Get ready. No! Ten. Nine. The freak show that Ethan just witnessed instantly reminded him of the time he woke up inside the Baker home. Once again, he found himself fighting for survival for somebody else's entertainment. The underground tunnels were filled with lichens and closed exits that led Ethan into a death pit with an enormous spinning trap. Thanks to his quick reaction time and survival instinct, he decided to use the trap to free himself from his binds. Something like Spring American Ground Beef! <laughs> Ethan successfully escaped with his life. No normal man would continue going back into the nightmare he had escaped from, but Ethan had a deep love for his daughter. Nothing would keep him away from saving Rose, and he wouldn't be alone on his mission. Just outside the castle entrance, he met a new friend, the Duke, the village's resident, traveling, profit-driven merchant. Mysteriously wise beyond his years, and filled with knowledge on events transpiring in and outside the village, due to his friendship with merchants from other regions. I've been waiting for you, Mr. Winters. How do you know my name? Anyone who is anyone has heard of the likes of you. A hero searching for his daughter. Though I must say, that castle arouses suspicion. Yeah, and so do you. <laughs> I am but a humble merchant. Here? Oh, forgive my manners. Call me the Duke. Now to business. The Duke would help Ethan on his journey in exchange for profit, supplying him with the equipment he needed to survive. And inside the nearby castle, that will to survive would be tested by one of the village's four lords, Lady Dimitrescu and her daughters. Mother, I bring you fresh prey. You are so kind to me, daughters. <laughs> ah, now, let's take a look at him. Well, well, Ethan Winters. You escaped my little brother's idiot games, did you? Let's see how special you are. Yes, Mother. Yes, Mother. <laughs> Starting to go a little stale. Then let's devour his man flesh quickly, Mother. But I am the one who captured him. Now, now, daughters. First, I must inform Mother Miranda. But later, well, there will be enough for everyone. <laughs> Udama! Hey, hey, wait. Oh, be 
careful what you wish for, Ethan Winters. <laughs> <laughs> Ethan was strung up by hooks and in incredible pain, but his resilient body allowed him to struggle enough to get loose. He had to find Rose and escape from the castle before the vampire-like monsters could feed on him. The castle was an incredibly old structure built in the 15th century and used by the Dimitrescu bloodline descended from one of the Four Kings to rule over the village's population. But from the 1950s to the 2020s, the castle was a symbol of fear, a place where devils lived. It was used by Mother Miranda and Lady Dimitrescu, the current head of her bloodline, to perform experiments on innocent victims with the Cadu Parasite. Lady Dimitrescu herself was such an experiment. She was born Alcina Dimitrescu sometime prior to the year 1914, and although her family's ancestry traced back to the village, she grew up in the outside world. At some point as a young woman, she enjoyed a brief musical career during the jazz boom of the 1930s as part of a group called Miss D and the Paul Boys. Alcina struggled throughout her life with a hereditary blood disease, and after the Second World War, she returned to her family's ancestral homelands in the village. At the age of 44, Mother Miranda lured her into a crypt beneath the village cemetery where she would attempt one of her miracle cures using the Kadu. She surgically implanted the parasite into Alcina, hoping to create Ava's perfect vessel. But her blood disease and genetic profile caused a mutation Miranda hadn't seen in a specimen yet. Alcina's body grew immensely to almost 10 feet tall. She grew long, retractable claw-like nails, and just like Miranda, the parasite had essentially halted her aging, allowing her to keep the same appearance throughout the decades. But the mutation was flawed, causing Miranda to determine Alcina as a failed experiment. Her blood disease became even further aggravated in something similar to vampirism. Her body required a flesh supply of blood to maintain the balance of her mutation. Although she was a failure, Mother Miranda honored her bloodline by giving her partial control over the village as a descendant of the Four Kings. She was allowed to take her old family castle as her home, and her reign of terror began as Lady Dimitrescu. Villagers were used as a food source and as further experimentation victims. She also used that same blood to create a type of wine that she would enjoy on any given evening. Eventually, she received help from villagers via forced servitude, three of whom, although biologically unrelated, would go on to become her daughters. At some point before 1958, three girls were experimented on with the Kadu. They were placed in a comatose state, forced to become a host of the parasite, and the Kadu reacted by laying hundreds of small eggs inside their bodies, and what eventually emerged from those eggs were mold imitations resembling blowflies. This new species of mold fly were carnivorous and immediately began feeding on the girls' bodies. Within a week, the bodies had been completely consumed, and the three separate colonies of mold flies reconverged into a mass of mold after absorbing their DNA. Gradually, the mass took the form of the three girls the flies had consumed, and they awoke. The girls were dead, consumed by a ravenous hunger, but fly colonies were able to mimic a human form without any memory of their previous identities. Lady Dimitrescu became fond of the girls, Bella, Daniela, and Cassandra, and adopted them as her own daughters, although they truly were never human. The girls brought in more victims to the castle and drained men of their blood, which was then stored in massive amounts underground and in barrels. Females, maidens from the village, were used as test subjects. Although most men became lichen, the women became something else. They were drained of blood, infected with mold, and revived into new forms that lacked any regeneration abilities and had low intelligence. These creatures were then thrown into the dungeons as slaves and were used to attack any would-be intruders. And some of the same mutations continued further, resulting in a variant mold creature with wings that patrolled the village, all once young human females. Lady Dimitrescu's daughters were seen by the villagers as the witches of Castle Dimitrescu. And although they didn't need human blood to survive as their mother did, they still mimicked her actions and lifestyle, and enjoyed consuming villagers of their own. For the girls' comfort, the castle was kept mostly dark and very cold. They could go out and hunt, but on exceptionally cold days and nights, they had to remain indoors. The mold flies they were created from had a weakness to any cold below 10 degrees Celsius. If they ever became that cold, the mold will go into hibernation state, and they'll be left completely vulnerable to attack. A fact that Ethan learned while he was hunted by them inside the castle. Uh. 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 
bullets cannot harm. <gasps> You stupid man thing! I feel no pain! Once Lady Dimitrescu discovered that Ethan dared attack her daughters, she was infuriated and immediately contacted Mother Miranda to inform her that Ethan had survived. She wanted him out of her castle, but Dimitrescu was powerless against Mother Miranda's demands. Miranda created her and could easily unmake her, and a frustrated Lady Dimitrescu swore that Ethan would pay. I won't let you down. <laughs> To hell with the ceremony! That man will pay for what he's done! Oh, shit. There you are. All this for a child who isn't even here. What the hell do- uh! You ungrateful, selfish wretch! You come into my house! You lay your filthy man hands on my- Daughters! And now you even try to steal my property! How dare you! Rest while you can! Because I will hunt you! And I will break you! Blackheart let you get away. You'll be sliced to ribbons before you ever see the child. You will learn what it means to insult me. <laughs> Running will get you nowhere! After Ethan's escape, he made his way through the top of the castle and discovered information that could possibly help him end the threat of Lady Dimitrescu. During the medieval period, a dagger was forged to kill even the most terrifying mold creatures in the region. It was seeped with multiple toxins, poisons that could possibly destabilize an infection, and came to be known as the Dagger of Death's Flowers. Sometime in the 20th century, the dagger made its way into the hands of a villager bent on assassinating her. He almost succeeded in the attempt on her life, but was killed. The dagger was then hidden with his body and sealed within one of the castle's towers to keep anybody from attempting another assassination. But Ethan discovered the location of the tomb and escaped Lady Dimitrescu's pursuit long enough to retrieve it. 
Cause Lady Dimitrescu mutation to completely destabilize, resulting in her transformation into the giant creature Ethan destroyed. After the battle, he discovered a strange vial containing some sort of biological material he couldn't quite identify. Clearly, it was important, and it could potentially hold a clue to where Rose was being hidden. He needed answers immediately and encountered the old hag he met before, Mother Miranda in disguise. As the midnight moon rises on black wings, we await the light at the end. In life and in death, glory to Mother Miranda. Hey, remember me? I almost died up at that castle. Tell me, what is going on around here? How can a man be almost dead? That's a question for the wise. You know what I mean. And I still haven't found Rose. Where did Mother Miranda take her? <laughs> You're too late! Or maybe almost too late. The child will be sacrificed, life for life. What kind of sick medieval shit is this? She's just a baby. The crests of the four bloodlines may open the path you seek. Will you please stop talking in riddles? I just want to find my daughter. It's only a riddle if you don't know the answer. <laughs> the old lady spoke in riddles and encouraged Ethan to continue his journey. Mother Miranda's plan was going exactly as she wished. Ethan followed the path she lay forth for him, but he still had no answers. Only one person remained that could shed some light on the horrifying truth. It was all worthless. Is that so? I assume you've picked up something of value. Not sure if it's of value, but... Why, you have your daughter right in your own hands. What are you saying? Take a closer look. <sighs> huh. 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 
that flask seems to contain her head. No. What? Roses... Don't say another word! Mother Miranda separated Rosemary's body into four parts and placed each body part inside a vial. This would have surely killed a normal child, but Rose was special. Since her entire body was a perfect mold vessel, she could be combined back together again within the mold and survive as if it never happened. The purpose of her separation was unclear to Ethan, but Miranda very specifically gave one vial to each lord, under the guise of keeping Ethan away from Rose until the resurrection ritual was ready. Mother Miranda's actual plan was to increase the strength of the mold by allowing it to consume as many bodies as possible, but she also desired to rid herself of her now pointless four lords, her failed experiments. Without villagers to keep in check, they were unnecessary, and disposing of them would only make the mold stronger. Giving each lord a vial with one of Rose's body parts would ensure that Ethan would go after them. After Ethan destroyed them, she would dispose of him, combine the vials, and resurrect Ava within Rose. The road to the second lord was a desolate one, covered in additional graves that didn't fit inside the village, and dolls hanging from trees. While exploring the path, Ethan caught a glimpse of Mia quickly, and she was gone. He was entering the domain of the doll maker, Donna Beneviento, last surviving member of the village's Beneviento bloodline one of Mother Miranda's most tragic victims. As a child, Donna's family slowly came apart. One of the Beneviento family members, Bernadette, was taken by Mother Miranda for experimentation, and she didn't survive. Throughout the rest of the 20th century, the family became smaller and smaller. As a child, Donna suffered from severe anxiety and had issues communicating, preferring isolation instead. Her father was an experienced doll maker and built her a doll she named Angie to help her cope with her issues. Claudia, another member of the family, died in 1996 when she was only nine years old. Donna's parents both ended their own lives. By the turn of the century, Donna was the only one left. She spent her time alone inside the Beneviento estate, a mansion overlooking a waterfall by the mountains connected to the village via a suspension bridge nearby. In her extreme isolation, Donna further lost her mind and obsessed herself with doll making. She built several dolls and filled her home with them, replacements for the family that she had lost. Sometime after 1996, Mother Miranda decided to implant Donna with her own kadoo and see what effect it had on the girl. Contrary to Lady Dimitrescu's dramatic physical mutations, Donna experienced very few, besides a severe deformity over her eye. She appeared mostly normal, but developed the ability to secrete a psychoactive chemical that could induce extreme hallucinations in others that were almost indistinguishable from reality. It was a useful ability, but due to her existing mental issues, Mother Miranda also considered her a failure. In spite of her attitude towards her, Donna Beneviento saw Miranda as a mother figure and enjoyed the responsibility of being one of the Four Lords, something she regularly gloated about to her gardener a villager that she kept employed by using her abilities to create visions of his own deceased family. After her kadoo implantation, Donna took her relationship with her doll Angie another step forward and surgically removed a portion of her own kadoo, implanting it inside the doll. From there, the two separate pieces formed a miniature colony of their own that allowed Donna to quite literally communicate through her doll and control its movements, making it appear as if it were alive. When Ethan entered her home, reality and hallucinations began blending together, sending him into a madhouse where his deepest fears could take form. Donna used her own powers and mold and infected pollen to create powerful illusions inside and outside the home. Deep in the house's basement, he found a doll representation of Mia, complete with the photo of his dead wife, and a radio playing on its own with her voice coming through it. The descent into madness continued just around the corner. The Mia doll appeared to have given birth. There was a trail of blood on the ground and an umbilical cord. Could his daughter be attached to the other side? Could Rose be down here simply waiting for her father?
Brendan's fears about Rose living with her inhuman nature and his guilt over failing to protect Mia took the form of a monstrous baby that only wanted its father to love it. The hallucinations were strong, and he rushed to leave the house. If he couldn't clear his mind, he would never be able to save Rose. But leaving wouldn't be as simple as walking out of the home. Angie was waiting for him, with her army of dolls. <laughs> Things right. Ethan fought through the hallucinations and successfully destroyed the source. Donna was dead, and he had the second vial this time containing Rose's legs. Only two lords remained in Ethan's way before he could see his daughter again. The Duke guided him to the location of the third lord's domain, an enormous reservoir located close to an obsolete fishing village that once fed the people living in the area. In recent years, villagers were terrified of its waters after sightings of a huge fish-like creature. Just outside the reservoir, Ethan encountered one of the third lord's most vile experiments. While the creature was similar to a lichen, it was a variant mutation, much faster and much more powerful than a normal lichen. The third lord, Salvatore Moreau, created the new species by capturing existing lichen and injecting wolf blood directly into their spinal cords. His hope was that the lichen mutation could be made stable enough to allow for Mother Miranda's approval. Instead, injecting the wolf DNA caused the mutation to spiral out of control, and the lichens lost any sense of intelligence, becoming pure, feral beasts closer to attack dogs than men. Ethan found the area around the reservoir covered in grotesque, gooey enzymes, leading to windmills once powering the region's electrical grid, and an underground tunnel where Salvatore Moreau was hidden away, watching his favorite television programming, completely leaving the vial containing Rose's arms unprotected. Mother Miranda, if it's for 
do. I'll do anything. Oh. I'll just be taking this. Mother's special child. She's not hers. Oh, you have something to say? What do you mean, mother's special child? Mother wants her baby back. Don't screw with me. Wait, 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 please, please. If you take it, then the others will laugh at me. But if I, I do better than them. What do I care? Wait, just a little longer, please. <laughs> What's so funny? <laughs> You're stupid. You talk too much. <laughs> it's all over. I plugged away in. What are you? It's my territory. I won't let you leave. Shit. While Donna Beneviento was one of Mother Miranda's most tragic experiments, Salvatore Moreau was the most pathetic. Moreau was completely focused on gaining her approval and being accepted by the other three lords. For generations, his family maintained alliances with the rest of the ruling houses in control of the village. Moreau, like the others, was a normal man, his family's last surviving member, and a man that had both a nautical and medical background. Being the last member of his family meant that Mother Miranda had no choice but to use him as an experiment for Kadu implantation, which resulted in one of the most extreme mutations she had ever witnessed. The implanted parasite caused him to grow an immense hunched back, gills, and other fish-like appendages. In her eyes, these were all useless physical changes, and completely unworthy of being the vessel for her daughter's return. Moreau's face also became completely deformed, and the other lords looked at him mostly as a worthless addition to their council. But Moreau was determined to prove himself worthy of their respect, so he quietly isolated himself in the reservoir to work on his experiments until he had something to show. In the meantime, he would wallow alone, in a total lack of self-worth. Getting Moreau's vial was suspiciously easy, but Ethan began his trip back to go after the fourth vial. And on the way, he came across the man that destroyed his life. What the hell? Research post or something? What the fuck are they doing here? Get off of me! Stay the fuck down! Ethan! I gotta say, I'm surprised you made it this far. It'd be a shame if something happened to you now. Sure, Chris. Why not? You killed Mia. Now do me and finish the job! Hey, Cap. I'm getting some serious motion readings out here. We should move on. What kind of readings? What's moving? I'm none. But my guess is we've been here too long, and Miranda knows it. Hey, hey, did you say Miranda? How are you involved? Leave it alone, Ethan. You are out of your depth. What about the sample analysis? It's definitely related to the mold. You stay out of our business, Ethan. What they got? Watch out! For this. Miranda sent you to slow me down. You're pathetic. What the fuck is wrong with you? The 
village's rumored fish monster appeared. It was Moreau's ultimate transformation. He had the ability to switch between his deformed human and giant aquatic form. When Moreau wasn't researching new experiments, he would be feeding on unsuspecting fishermen, leaving few survivors, and only stories of his existence. If Moreau needed water to maneuver in the area, Ethan would take the water away. Turning the power back on for the windmills would allow him to drain the water in the reservoir, leaving Moreau like a helpless fish. Meanwhile, Chris evacuated the area with his hound wolf squad. They'd been searching for Rose the entire time to rescue her and Miranda to take her out, as they originally planned. But Chris's operation needed careful planning and he still didn't want Ethan involved. Eventually, Ethan was successful in draining the area and Moreau made his final attempt to retrieve the vial he carelessly lost. <laughs> Death as he was in life. Disgusting. The exit's up ahead. You're better off than I thought. Who's that? Oh, come on. We just met a while back, not that it really matters. You're the last asshole in my way, aren't you? You've got fight. I'll give you that, Ethan. But what's the plan when you have all four flasks? What are you trying to get at? I could lend you a hand. Uh, trying to get on my good side? Oh, don't get cocky. I'd kill you if you weren't worth the trouble. There's a stronghold. Not too far outside the village. Go there, and get my flask. Do that, and you pass. First, head back to the graveyard. Self-centered prick. Is that alive? After Moreau's death, Ethan would face his greatest challenge yet, the fourth and final lord who was extending an open invitation. To reach him, he had to travel back through the village again into the very heart of Lycan territory. Just outside the village was the stronghold the Lycans made their primary den after Mother Miranda had banished them. Beyond an old sawmill known as Otto's Mill, where a furious axe-wielding mold mutation made its home. With the assistance of the explosives surrounding the area, Ethan was able to kill the beast and continue on towards the Lycan stronghold. There was an infestation of Lycans rushing the area. At one time, innocent villagers living peacefully, now ravenous mutants wanting nothing more than to feed on Ethan. And at the end of the stronghold, the way out was guarded by the huge Lycan that Ethan faced when he first arrived in the village. He was known in his human life as Urias, one of the two brothers that lived in the village and respected by the others. Urias was originally the village chief, now nothing more than a Lycan enforcer. His mutation gave him incredible strength and he towered over the rest of the Lycan. Asshole. I'm not letting you get out of this. <laughs> cool your jets. Just a little bit more, and you're all wrapped up. I'll lend you a hand. So in exchange... In exchange what? First of all, come to me. Put all the flasks in the altar, and I'm sure you'll figure the rest out. See you, Ethan. God damn it.
Mysteriously, the flask with Rose's torso was left by the Fourth Lord for Ethan to find. It felt like a trap, but the Fourth Lord was eager to meet with Ethan. In fact, the Fourth Lord had a plan of his own. Ethan and Rose were the allies he needed to accomplish his goals. To reach him, Ethan had to place all four vials with Rose's body parts inside an old artifact known as the Giant's Chalice that the ancient civilization that was located here used. With the weight of all four flasks and the giant's chalice combined, the stone elevator built into the mountain was activated, and the way to the fourth lord opened. Through a built-in speaker, he promised Ethan that Rose would be alright as he anxiously waited for his guest, the same man that tried to kill him when he first entered past the gates of Castle Dimitrescu, the fourth lord, Carl Heisenberg. What the hell? Mia? Truth hurts, <laughs> don't <laughs> Let me guess. You're thinking, take me out like the others, and then he gets to go and save Rose, right? I'm healing my daughter. Look, you, you, you got this all wrong. Tell me what I'm talking about. Shut your fucking hole! I'm sorry about that. Take a seat. Listen, Ethan, you're being played. What are you talking about? You think this is a game? I said sit! <sighs> Lady, supersized bitch. Ugly ass psycho doll. An emeronic freak. Don't you get it? It's a test. To see if you're strong enough to be a part of Miranda's family. I don't want to be a part of Miranda's family. Neither did I, but here we are! And I'm next in line, right? Kill me, move up the chain, well fuck them! I don't give a damn about your personal issues. I just want to fix my daughter. <laughs> so do I. Do you have any idea how powerful a kid is? Even Miranda's scared of her. Last time, you freak! I swear to God! You and me, Ethan. Together, we can go save Rose, and we can use her to grind Miranda into paste. My daughter is not a weapon. Fuck you! <laughs> Last chance. You don't want to find out what's in that hole. I'll take my chances. You're few. Ethan turned down Heisenberg's offer and ran for his life against one of his creations. Although the idea of teaming up to stop Miranda and save Rose was an appealing one, Heisenberg couldn't be trusted. Ethan knew he just wanted to use Rose as a weapon, something he couldn't allow. After escaping the creature, he found himself deep underground Heisenberg's factory, the structure that was originally created in the late 19th century over a coal mine by previous members of the Heisenberg bloodline. Heisenberg had a deep hatred for Mother Miranda. He wanted nothing more than to gain the power to destroy her. He never wanted to be experimented on, never wanted to be one of her four lords. But his ancestry attracted her to him, and he was forcibly implanted with a kadu. His body formed a powerful bond with the parasite. No mutations were physically visible, and his mind was still his own. But he did develop incredible abilities. With the Gadoo inside, his organs became electric and allowed him to control magnetic fields around himself, essentially making him a powerful electric magnet and the most dangerous of the Four Lords. Although Mother Miranda found his powers to be astonishing, for reasons of her own, she determined Heisenberg wasn't worthy. Over the years, he played his part, pretending to be loyal to Miranda, but secretly he planned his revenge on the side, his freedom from her control. He was an engineering genius, and secretly and slowly, he repurposed the factory deep underground as his own weapons research facility and spent his evenings grave robbing. He collected the bodies and used the mold to experiment on them in an effort to revive them and build his army. 
Many were completely unsuitable for combat, and he used parts found in the factory to enhance them, until he had assembly line after assembly line of undead drones. The factory had long ago been used for weapons manufacturing for the two world wars, and valuable metals and equipment were everywhere. He removed the hearts of the bodies he collected, and replaced them with a Kadu parasite, with a reactor over it to enhance its capabilities. The muscles of the corpses were stimulated by electricity, and cybernetic headgear would stabilize their neural activity enough to follow Heisenberg's every command. Heisenberg had quite literally created an army of the dead. Inside Heisenberg's factory, Ethan came close to death multiple times fighting back against his super soldiers, but the dangerous creature he escaped from when he first fell underground was still on the prowl. It was Heisenberg's most uncontrollable creation. Heisenberg called it the Sturm. Instead of arm-mounted drills or sophisticated cybernetics, Sturm was equipped with a massive turboprop engine with three chainsaw blades attached that could wind at incredible speeds and shred their victims in seconds. But Heisenberg considered it a total failure, he made sure to keep his monstrosity underground. Though terrifying to encounter, Sturm was practically uncontrollable, had low intelligence enough that it cut its own arms off accidentally. Thanks to Chris's military training, Ethan was quickly able to spot a weakness, the exposed reactor on its backside. Now stay down! Heisenberg had had it with Ethan. He refused his offer of an alliance, destroyed many of his experiments in the factory, and simply would not die. This time, Heisenberg would confront Ethan himself. Using his magnetic powers, Heisenberg demonstrated the extent of what he could really do. What the... I've got a rebellion. So stay out of it. attracted much of the metal in the area and fused it within his body, creating a marriage of man and machine. Next time he encountered Ethan, he would show no mercy. What Heisenberg was unaware of was that while he was distracted with Ethan, Chris and the Hound Wolf Squad had already infiltrated the factory and planted explosives enough to cripple his war plans. Once again, fate drew Ethan and Chris together, and Ethan finally learned the truth. I told you to leave it alone, Ethan! You are in the way. What do you care, Chris? You killed my wife, you son of a bitch! You think I killed Mia? That wasn't her. It was Miranda. What? She's a bioweapon. She changed her appearance and pretended to be Mia. Seems she also survived being shot, so now I'm here to finish the job. Bullshit! Why don't you fucking tell me right away? Because I knew you would want to be involved! This job is hard enough without civilians getting in the way. Why us, Chris? What the hell is going on? All right, Ethan. All right. I guess I owe you an explanation. Long story short, Miranda's fucking insane. In this village, all these monsters and freaks, this is her life's work. Some sort of crazy experiment with the mold. The mold. Like Louisiana. God damn it. All this time, I thought I could save my family. I can't escape from here. I can't do anything. That might not be true. Take a look at this. My men sent those pictures a few minutes ago. Miranda. Keep looking. Rose. Holy shit, we gotta go! Relax, my men are monitoring the situation. But they have my daughter. You don't get it, Ethan. You don't stand a chance against Miranda by yourself. 
внезапно. I will stay down here and finish planting explosives. You take that elevator. I'll meet you topside. I promise you, we will get your daughter back. Together. Damn straight we will. And when I find Miranda, she's a dead woman. Chris decided to finally allow Ethan into the operation. While he finished planting the explosives in the factory, Chris allowed Ethan to use the vehicle he put together to face Heisenberg. The fourth and final Lord was waiting on the surface, never expecting that Ethan had a war machine of his own. dealt with Heisenberg. Now I'm gonna find Miranda and get Rose back. Not without me. It's too dangerous. Wait there, you hear me? Ethan? Rose? Ethan! Ethan, respond! Mia? A child. She's so important, isn't she? She's everything to me. <laughs> and mine to me. With Heisenberg on, you've lost your lead. What are you going to do? I don't know, but I'm saving Rose. You'd never know, do you? Even when I took Mia's place in your home. Poor Ethan. Who are you? Where's Rose? <laughs> <laughs> Remember Evelyn and her power over them all? Rose is her successor. No. Rose is Evelyn's true, complete form. She will grow to fully control the masses. And I must have her. Fuck you, you crazy bitch! Uh, uh, uh. Calm yourself. Rose will be safe. The Mega My Seat catalogs all of us. However, she will be reborn as my daughter. She's my child, not yours! Where are you? Show yourself! Why did Rose come to be? Was it because of her parents? And you are truly a special case. But I've learned all I can from your worth as a lab rat has run out. Miranda! You coward! Come on and face me! Don't worry. Your death will come quick. You will join the Mega My Seeds records. I will make sure to sample your blood for later. Once dawn breaks, the ceremony will be complete, and I will become her true mother, bound for eternity in blood. <laughs>
Miranda's game was over. All four of her lords were out of the way, and she disposed of Ethan, as planned. He played his part perfectly, and the mold underneath the village was strong enough to begin her resurrection ritual. All that remained between Miranda succeeding now was Chris Redfield and his team. Chris thought if he played his cards differently, perhaps if he had let Ethan know the truth before, he might have still been alive. He was wrecked with guilt and anger and swore that Miranda would be brought to justice. We'll get her, Captain. The squad's ready for you. So BSAA got here already. They didn't waste any time. Mission adjustment? No, doesn't change anything. Terminate Miranda and rescue Rose. That's the mission. And failure's not an option. Let's have some fun, people. Like old times. Move out. Roger. Okay. K9, I want to know what the hell BSAA is doing here. Find out what you can. Roger that. I'm on it. Hey, Alpha. Look at this. Pretty rough down there. How are you planning on reaching the objective? First, we're gonna have to take that thing out. Got your back, boss. Let's get to work. The village was being completely overrun by chaos. With the deaths of the four lords and the villagers completely consumed, the mold was bursting out of the ground, growing out of control, threatening to spread outside the village. It was growing too strong, too rapidly, just as Miranda wanted. As she prepared Ava's resurrection within the body of Rose, she ordered all remaining lichens to protect the source of the mold at all costs. But Chris and his team were well-trained veteran warriors, determined to fulfill their mission and backed by blue umbrella equipment and technology. The BSA arrived at the same time, but they carelessly dropped troops in the middle of the combat zone, again proving how ineffective the organization had become, losing lives as if they were nothing. Chris and the Hound Wolf squad made their way around and worked their way into the village, expertly dispatching lichens as a team and blowing a hole big enough for them to find the source. The remaining lichens were destroyed, and as a last line of defense, the mold unleashed one of its strongest monsters, Urias Strayer, the older brother of the Urias that Ethan fought in the lichen stronghold. The older brother was significantly stronger and more resilient than his younger brother, but still couldn't survive a direct artillery strike. Just beyond, Chris discovered what was so important, what the remaining creatures were protecting. The Hound Wolf squad analyzed the mold in the area and found no gene editing at all like the mold in Louisiana, which only meant one thing. The mold found here was the original source, the Black God, the Megamycete. Alpha the squad, I've located the Megamycete. So now we can end this mess after all. About damn time. And two explosives armed. There's enough there to blow the whole village sky high. Let's get out of here and blow the damn place. Not before I end Miranda. I'm not taking any more chances. I'm going in. Roger that. Standing by. The explosives were set. With one button, Chris could destroy the source of the mold and turn the entire village into a crater. But he wasn't taking any more chances with Miranda. He couldn't risk her surviving another attack. 
Just behind the Mega My seat, Chris found the entrance to Miranda's lab, where she performed all of her early research into the mold, and he found a treasure trove of documents proving her links to the connections and the events of Dolby, Louisiana. Everything Chris had been fighting for since the Spencer Mansion incident was indirectly Miranda's doing. And Miranda kept another secret locked away in her lab, Mia Winters herself. Show me your hands! Umbrise, this is Alpha. Where is Miranda right now? Still the ceremony site. Whatever she's doing, she's staying put. God damn. It really is you. I'm glad you're safe, Mia. Why are you here? I was caught. In Houston experiments. Wait, did you say Mia? Mia Winters? In the flesh. What's the situation up there? Kind of a war going on. Nothing we can't handle. Don't get distracted. Stick to the mission. I'm headed to the ceremony site. Wait. You can't leave me here. You promised, damn it! You said that you would keep us safe. We did everything that you asked. We moved over here, everything! And I didn't care. So long as we were together. So you tell me. Where is my husband? Where is my daughter? Ethan is... He's gone. I couldn't save him. But I can save Rose. Come on. It's not safe here after all. What do you mean he's gone? He's dead. I'm sorry, Mia, but we have to leave. We have to destroy this village. No! You're wrong. I tried to keep this a secret, but... You don't understand how special he is. To Chris's shock, this was the real Mia. She was alive. Chris couldn't save Ethan, but at least he could save Mia and Rose. But a father's love was strong, and Mia stressed that Ethan wasn't finished yet. She revealed the truth behind Ethan's resilience to Chris. He was a construct of the mold, and much more difficult to dispatch than a normal human. Ethan was still alive, drifting in and out of consciousness, and he heard a voice that he hadn't heard since the Baker House. Evie. Perhaps still, somehow, a tiny piece of her existed within his mind, within the mold. Evelyn, how are you here? You're dead. Dead? I mean, Miranda. She... No. I still have to save Rose. Wrong! It wasn't Miranda. You were always dead. What are you saying? I can still... See? Miranda didn't kill you. You mean you didn't think it was weird? No matter how much you got hurt? Remember? Messing with my head. You shouldn't be walking. Screw <laughs> you! What, what am I? I, I, I did all that. 
Ethan was hit with the realization that he was no longer human. He hadn't been for years. He was killed by Jack Baker in Louisiana, and he was merely a mold copy of the person he used to be. With his fierce determination, he pushed forward and regained consciousness, finding himself in the Duke's carriage. Although Miranda pulled his heart out, it was simply a mold imitation of a heart. By now, his body had already replaced the organ and partially repaired itself. The Duke found him and carried him to safety while he recovered, but the injuries Ethan suffered were severe. Just like Jack Baker after multiple encounters, Ethan's body couldn't take much more punishment before finally falling apart. This was his last chance to save Rose. We're here. I owe you one. Mr. Winters, I'm afraid you can't return to your old world any longer. Are you ready? Yeah, I have to be. <clears throat> Ethan thanked the Duke for helping him, and he set out to find his daughter and end the nightmare, even if it killed him. Without hesitation, Ethan gunned down the creatures in his way and pushed into the ritual chamber, where he found Mother Miranda recombining Rose into her original form. Her plot was doomed to fail, though. As she tried to push Eva's consciousness via the mold into Rose, Rose's body gave a small display of its potential power. Unintentionally, Rose was fighting back against the intrusion naturally, and Miranda's powers began to weaken. As Heisenberg had told Ethan before, even Miranda was afraid of Rose's power. This was Ethan's chance to finally destroy Miranda's century-long plot. <laughs> My power is leaving me! Rose! <laughs> Miranda! Interesting. Your body certainly isn't normal. Give Rose to me! Now! You will see. Once I kill you properly, every- Get her, now! <sighs> Let go! I've spent a lifetime creating this moment. And you try to take it away from me. I will take what is due. Desires will be fulfilled! No. Rose is mine! What the fuck? You fulfilled your purpose, Rose. You disposed of my false children and awakened the glorious man. Never see your face again. I will feed you to the price. Every single cell of your being.
Mother Miranda's body collapsed, and she began fusing with the source with the Megamycete. Ethan only had a limited time to leave with his daughter before it was too late to leave the explosion. But even Ethan Winters couldn't cheat death any further. His body couldn't hold itself together anymore, but it didn't matter, as long as Rose survived. Ethan! Ethan! Come on, Ethan. Come on, Ethan, wake up! Oh, no. Chris. Ethan. He did it. It's finished. I think we've finished each other. Ethan. We gotta move. Keep moving, Ethan. There's a bomb in that thing that'll blow this whole village sky high. Hey, look at me. When I hit this trigger, we can't be anywhere near it. Ah, damn it. Mia's waiting for you. She's alive, you hear me? Alive. Mia. I'm so sorry. I love you. Keep Rose safe. Hey, hey. Hey. <laughs> Tell yourself. Now come on, it's not that much further. Watch over her. Teach her to be strong. God damn it. Goodbye, Rosemary. Ethan. Rose! Go! Go, take us up now! Get moving. We have to get clear. No! We can't go, not without my husband! Mia, sit down and strap in. Not before you tell me where Ethan is. I know he wouldn't abandon us. Down. Where is he? Chris, what have you done? He's gone. I tried. He stayed so we could all escape. I'm sorry. Captain, you need to see this. BSAA didn't send soldiers. This is a bioweapon. The hell were they thinking? Orders, Captain. Pick up the rest of the squad. Plot a course for BSAA Europe HQ.
Someone's gotta pay. The BSA had become the monster it promised to destroy. Instead of preventing the use of bioweapons, it was directly using them in combat now. The exact world that Spencer and the Umbrella Corporation were once trying to create. Chris Redfield set out to get answers. A story for another time. For now, Ethan Winters was gone. He gave the ultimate sacrifice to ensure that his family could continue without him. Years later, an older teenage Rose was alive and well. She grew up under the protection and supervision of Chris Redfield and his men, teaching her to control her powers, using them for good, as a strong young woman. Just as Ethan asked in his dying wish, ending the father's story and the events of Resident Evil Village. Hey, Dad. Happy birthday. Sorry I missed last week. I have a lot of tests coming up. You know how it is. <laughs> Talk of the goddamn devil. Duty calls. I love you. Yeah, I found her. Where else? Today of all days. <clears throat> we have a situation. You're needed, <laughs> Evelyn. Don't you ever call me that again. Whoa, whoa, it's just a joke, Rose. I can show you things even Chris doesn't know I can do. <sighs> we have a clear shot. Stand down. I can handle it. We need to keep it together, Rose. You're a lot like him, you know? I know. If you'd like to support my work, I invite you to become a patron so you can get access to my Patreon feed containing exclusive updates and progress reports on videos. There's multiple levels of support available. You can also choose to become a channel member and gain access to exclusive polls deciding what games are going to be streamed, moderator privileges, badges, and emojis for live chat. And I'd like to thank my current patrons and channel members for their continued support. If you enjoyed the video, hit like, subscribe, and click the bell for all notifications. And make sure you follow me on social media so you never miss a thing. I'll catch you guys later.